name is Stephen Revel. I am the Smart Cities Open Data Manager for the Scottish Cities Alliance. Um, important information about the Scottish Cities here with our with our website and uh, also our Twitter tag. So please tweet. Uh, feel free to tweet. So a little bit of background about the Alliance itself. Um, so it is made up of membership from all of the seven cities in Scotland and also the Scottish Government. Um, and it basically does its work around an operational plan, which has four key areas. Smart cities, which is kind of why I'm here today and why I've been involved in the group, and what I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Low carbon, hydrogen, and infrastructure and investment promotion. All of the idea behind this is around a collaborative approach, um, which is going to focus on innovation, innovative solutions and attracting investment and to create an environment to test out new ideas and business models. The, the pitch book, for example, that comes out of the infrastructure and investment promotion piece is very much get, 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 getting everything from Scotland together, Scottish cities together, and making that case to the outer world that Scotland is a place to invest, to be part of. Um, and so that's where this collaborative approach is, is pushing towards. So my talk today is going to be viewing data from a Scotland-wide perspective, so I'm not really focusing on any of the cities in particular. I've got a couple of small case study examples, but they really are just to highlight there is good practice going on rather than to, to pick any, any over the other or anything like that. Um, so I'm going to take a quick look back at where the kind of open data piece came from in the Scottish cities, um, outline the programme that we're working on now, which is around data, data governance, open data, and also look at <coughs> collaboration opportunities that that we want to progress because we want to look out and not just focus on doing doing some work basically so we've got some great examples pockets of good practice pockets of i guess really excited energetic people that have made things like this possible so one of the examples i often like to use is, is aberdeen um, they have a very uh, very energetic and uh, excited about open data a person called Ian Watt who would have been here today um, and he is digital transformation manager for the city uh, co-founder of the code the city uh, interest a public interest company which has been doing for nearly six years I think so it's around code hackathons and bringing people together around certain themes to solve certain problems um, and he's also uh, co-founder of the Open Data Institute node in Aberdeen, um, which remains the only uh, ODI node in Scotland, even though Ian, Ian would be keen to point out he doesn't want it to be an Aberdeen node. That's where the ODI like to progress things. He very much wants to expand everything uh, to Scotland. Um, so you have, you have people like that um, working uh, in Aberdeen, for example, on, on these, these types of things. And the Code the City events are... The last one was on uh, AI chatbots um, and how it can how it can help public sector development, um, which was really interesting. Um, hackathon weekend. You've also got um, Edinburgh doing some great work in, in this field too, and Sally, who's here today. <laughs> Sally Kerr has been working on open data. I, well, I'm pretty sure for longer than me, but you've done some really good work in pushing the open data agenda and being, <laughs> in some cases, if you don't mind me saying. The, the key driver in Edinburgh for open data. Um, even if you might have people involved, you're the kind of the key driver kind of thing. Um, so we've got the pe we've got people and pockets of good practice as well around this, and we've also had some funding pots as well. So for example, Nesta that embedded uh, Code Fellows uh, into public sector organisations to try and promote the use of open data and the open source um, software as well. Uh, and they've done some really great projects, and Sally could tell you about a couple of them, um, you know, but been really good. Uh, and some of them have been taken forward by the councils, and some of them have fallen away because the funding is, has gone away. So, you know, that I just wanted to say here that there are examples of, of really good practice in Scotland. Um, and another part of this journey from a Scotland city's perspective uh, around open data was Glasgow City Council winning. Uh, a technology demonstrator from Innovate UK, previously Technology Strategy Board. Um, it was £24 million aimed at developing smart city concepts effectively. And a third of that money, roughly, was invested in open data right back from the governance point all the way through. 
and for a, a period of 12 to 18 months it was really active um, re really groundbreaking in some terms uh, promotion of open data getting to a point where the open data website had 400 webs uh, 400 data sets on it some real-time data included in there um, started bedding in governance practices and and system links that would start taking data from CRM systems for example things like that um, but uh, I think when the, when the funding ended, as it were, uh, there was a need to find a place for it to go within the city because it didn't come in in a, in a service, it came in as a project. And I think Glasgow are getting to grips with that now um, and really looking to forge ahead uh, now, that they've, now that they've found a home, I suppose, for, for what we were calling smart cities or open data at the time, but they're, they're talking about it being their, their data analytics division now. So that helped. And then I think the Scottish Cities Alliance working in under the agreements that they had and the Scottish Government and this, well, the cities obviously through the Alliance recognised the need to build on, on the pockets of work and also the Glasgow work um, and really kind of sweat the asset of the idea of smart cities. So they did this by uh, creating, creating a model. Well, they started by creating a model of what a smart city was, um, taking in at least 20 examples of kind of best practice or whatever from across the world, condense that down to create a smart cities maturity model so that they could say, if you do this, you'll be more mature in smart cities. It wasn't about saying there is one thing you have to do, it's just saying these are steps that you can take along the way. Um, and I hear, according to uh, Aileen uh, of the Smart Cities Alliance, she said this week that Quebec cities have taken this model in the last couple of months and have adapted it a little bit. Um, and are looking to use it in, in their city. So that's, that's a little bit of an endorsement, uh, I would say at least. But from this model, there was a self-assessment um, piece set up. So the cities could go online, uh, self-assess themselves against this and create some outputs, effectively what they wanted to do and how it was going to improve the maturity. And then the Alliance and the Scottish Government brought this together into a coordinated investment roadmap. So it said, we know how much we want to spend on certain projects and it's going to improve the maturity this way. All really, I think, with the idea of helping to unlock investment, which um, it, it, did, it did then do, and I'll talk about that next. In terms of outcomes, so it linked the improvement in maturity um, to, to the projects. It also helped build capacity, I think, and, and start culture change within the organisations. Um, and, uh, and I think you see more evidence of it now because people have been talking around smart city concepts for a long, long time and are more vested in the idea and, and more happy with, with the idea of talking about it. And, and data is always at the core of that. And it did help secure this external funding. So this eight city programme is that programme of work. Um, and it's an ERDF funded, so it's got £10 million from the European Regional Development Fund uh, in our area. Um, Inverness is slightly different, they've got a slightly different intervention rate, they get more funding than the other six cities. But it's all come together under one umbrella um, and matched with, with funding from the Scottish cities as well to create this nice um, big programme of work for the next two years. And what they noticed was when they were doing the assessment of all of the, all of the kind of self-assessments was that the data one was fundamental to all of it. All of the cities outlined data as something they wanted to progress as a project, which was great, which was great. And in this visual, thankfully for me and for the work I'm doing, it sits right in the middle and is linked to every other project. And I didn't make this one up, so that was even better. Um, so it gives us links in with, with every other area within the programme. So what, what, is the, what is the data bit, effectively? So the data bit is formed of four interrelated work packages and the cities are working together on it um, to, to, to develop a common approach um, to, to data and manage open data. Um, and it's also, as the previous slide points out, an enabler for other eight city projects as well. So at a very high level, before I dive in a little bit more deeply, Work Package 1 is looking at common standards um, and at all stages of what, what I'm turning the open data supply chain, but every point the lady from Helsinki mentioned about making sure the data is owned by the city uh, and, and is available for reuse through, through APIs. Um, so everything from there, 
um, through to actually the publication of data, different types of web standards, that type of thing. It's all about improving data literacy if you, if you think about it. Then work package two is working towards, um, and this is part of the procurement discussions at the moment, a, f a federated approach. So uh, by, by the end in a couple of months time, it is likely that all of the cities will have a similar open data platform. Um, and it might also be possible that this will then be, be federated to a, a central point. Um, so that you only have to look once to go to Scottish cities data. You don't have to look at six different, seven different um, instances. We've then got the, the common approaches to big data analytics. And this was another key one. Um, all the cities recognise they have a lot of data, but don't have necessarily the skills or literacy to, um, to use that data, uh, to use it in a positive way and solve problems. So they're going to be looking uh, around common themes and developing common solutions and approaches to using the data more effectively in-house. And finally, and I'm going to talk probably more about this than anything else, is the build up the community and the capacity at the seven city scale. So not only are you talking about doing similar things that work, you're also going to be doing it at a seven city scale. Um, and actually wider than that, it's region scale. You know, it's not just about the cities themselves. There's no geographic boundary necessarily to, to data really, or data use. So very quickly, I don't want to bore people with all the work packages, uh, and some of you in here already know uh, a lot about them anyway. Um, so work package one, overview, <coughs> what are we going to do for the next two years up until the end of 2018? Um, so review existing standards, identify any gaps, um, understand how these standards are used at the moment and how they can be used, how they can be adopted. Um, and uh, Doug's leading on, on that work package. Um, and then We've already got some really great use cases to illustrate why standards are important, but it's about making sure people actually use them uh, rather than just proving that they're important. Um, and so we want to embed this agreement by the cities that they're going to use it. So it's a little bit ground up, a little bit top down. We want to reach a point where it's usable uh, and useful. Um, and all with the intent that the data that comes out at the <coughs> end is open data, is easy to reuse, is, is understandable for people. Um, and is a better asset for reuse than it, than it maybe necessarily would be. Work package two is the data platform itself, uh, so have a place to put the data. So at the moment, Edinburgh and Glasgow have a place to put the data online, um, and the other, the other cities have their websites, but they don't have like an open data platform effectively. So that is about really just bringing, bringing everybody uh, to the table on that one. And we're also going to be looking to publish common data sets as well. Um, so similar again to the to the lady from Helsinki talking about doing the same type of thing. We want to publish similar data sets, uh, and part of the work within within a later work package will be <coughs> assess which data sets maybe the most economically advantageous, maybe the ones that benefit the community the best, uh, those type of things. Here's work package three. I talked about most of this really. Um, we want to build up the capacity in data analytics and data science. Learn from other. Other cities learn from external partners as well. Uh, create shared algorithms and visualizations. So, you know, the work's done once in the cities and, and, and reused where possible. Develop a common framework and a develop common toolkit so that um, the process that people go through, they can learn from each other they, and they, they understand it and it can be used again. So they don't have to relearn the kind of type of processes and also the tools that they can use. You know, whether it's a technical tool or something else uh, for mapping skills, for example these things that can all be reusable, the toolkit's there for people to use. Um, and understand really where in-house analytics works um, and how it works with open data. And really I think this one is a big learning <coughs> curve for the cities. Um, really interesting. There'll be a lot of outreach from this to the university uh, skill set in Scotland um, and that type of thing. And then the community and capacity building. So want to grow best practice in cities here. Um, understand the current data literacy, benchmark, um, map the external ecosystem, uh, collaborate where possible and move towards a sustainable community um, in Scotland around open data. So just to prove, I want to talk a little bit more about Work Package 4, but just to prove we're actually doing some work in this area. Um, this is kind of the, the, the latest plan for Work Package 4 now. Probably can't read all that. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step through the processes anyway. Benchmarking piece is really important. The cities need to first of all understand where they are. Um, it's another kind of maturity mapping exercise to look at the people, the skills, the processes, 
um, the policies and the governance and things like that um, and work towards what level of coordination and effort there is there. So looking internally at the city councils. And this uh, image on the right hand side is from the ODI, um, the Data Skills Framework. Um, I don't know if many people have looked at it, but it's a great resource and, and very easy for us just to go and reuse it. So, you know, wh why wouldn't you, basically? So use, use that. We also want to look and map the external ecosystem. So we understand what the council does, but we, we need to understand what the other sectors potentially involved in open data or are involved in open data and what they can do. Um, so that will be looking at uh, who are the users, um, you know, is it, is it universities, is it research organisations or is it business trying to, trying to make some money um, or is it community uh, interest groups trying to solve some community related problems. Um, and uh, the sort of Bristol Open Data Network did an interesting piece of work last year that identified that the community reuse of data for community benefit was the highest um, reuse of data in their open data platform. And it was actually ahead of uh, companies wanting to make money. And I thought that was really interesting. So understand who these people are and what they can do um, with this piece. And this example here is, is from a, it's quite a, quite a difficult one, um, quite complex, but it's it's really good if you look at it. It's from um, a guy, Dan Randow in New Zealand, who's done some interesting work here. So back to this, uh, we also want to do that outreach piece within the cities as well. So we've got all these other pieces of work going on, smart infrastructure, smart services, mobility. How do we make sure that um, the smart waste solution getting procured in Stirling, for example, or Perth or whatever, and make sure that data is available for reuse. Um, and actually, we need to do a kind of a learning piece and tell people about it. Um, because some people, they might, they might think hackathons are great ideas and really love the idea, but if they haven't made sure that they can reuse the data, uh, by the time you've gone through a hackathon and got some really great ideas, the only people that can reuse the ideas potentially are the providers of the system in the first place, which is uh, obviously not ideal from a, from a council perspective. So try and embed that, embed that type of thinking. So basically, and this is what we're going out to all the, all the groups and saying, is how the data cluster can help your organisation or, or your group within that, sorry, your, your project within that. So in, ensure council ownership. Open APIs are procured. Um, look, at, look at applying the standards that the data cluster recommend. Um, and always support open data publication. From the analytics side of things, there is analytics capability in the work we're doing. So can these other groups use it? Can the smart lighting people pose challenges to, the, to our, our group and say, can you, can you solve this for us? Um, so those kind of challenges are very welcome from the data cluster. Um, on the publication side, again, we want people to publish the data there. So if it is intelligent street lighting, whatever data can be made available, you've, you've got a place to publish it. So let's make sure that works together because it would be quite uh, reprehensible if the program all around with data at the middle wasn't doing these things properly. Um, and it is about getting out and talking to everybody in all of these cities around these, these pieces of work. And then also the community thing. So if you're posing challenges for the analytics, you might also be posing challenges for hackathons and the community around themes and solving problems. Uh, so again, with the work that we're able to do, we can promote, promote benefits here as well. And then how this helps the data cluster? Well, people are using the standards, so we're, we're proving that the work we did was, was good, I suppose, um, and realistic. Um, <coughs> there's more data available. It also kind of looks good for the data cluster that data is getting put there. Um, data analytics um, is getting tested, is getting used in real scenarios, real business case holders that actually want some returns. And again, the community <coughs> has some really great ideas to, to form around, cluster around, um, and also, um, yeah, we have, we have exciting challenges for our open data community rather than ones that are maybe just made up uh, by people that want to have a hackathon, for example. Not saying that happens, just saying that it could. So, um, we also want to do this collaboration piece really strongly. So this isn't just about hackathons, obviously, but it, it provides a nice way to think about it. Um, we want to basically, within city partners and 
with uh, other partners, co-develop solutions effectively. That's what we really want to get to the point where we're co-producing on this, on this maturity <coughs> scale from the New Economics Foundation. But we have to start probably further down that stack um, and start with education and coercing it said here. That's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit scary maybe, um, to help pro pro uh, you know, really promote these opportunities. Um, and there's, there's so many, so many groups out there as well. And we've got, for example, uh, I think there's something like 90 students coming from the data uh, lab MSc this year, all really highly skilled and um, and good quality <coughs> students in data analytics, data science. You know, how can we bring them into this process? Um, and other groups like that. It's not just them, but that, that's a great example um, of what we kind of like to do. Another good example as well is around th the use of themes. So this is a NHS hack, the National Health Service hack from February this year. It was held in Edinburgh. Um, I think there was Edinburgh City Council people there, obviously. Um, but it wasn't geographically based. It was problem based around health. Um, and the NHS did a lot of work to release data for this particular weekend. Um, around themes and they, you know they got some cracking solutions as you often do with hackathons um, and they also got some cracking team names as well the second one down can you see it it's called hacking cough which <laughs> is a great a great a great team name uh, in that space i think so and there's a really nice write up of it a blog write up on it that i took this screenshot from about you know how great it was to come together around themes uh, rather than worry about city boundaries or anything like that and then we've got the kind of the community bit helping each other. Uh, this is the sort of facilitated by the Scottish Government. This is the Digital Public Services Open Data Network, um, which grew quite substantially last year because the Scottish Government did a training piece where they went out to public sector organisations and trained a few key individuals um, in open data. And it kind of this kind of took off for a bit. Uh, 300 people, a lot of talking, a lot of ideas. But I took this from yesterday, the screenshot, and the last post on it was the 6th of March. So I think when the project kind of fell away, you know, so a little bit did this. So it's a good example of where it can work, but also maybe where there's a need to, to change things a little bit. Uh, so we're getting a, a really, a really, yeah, a self-sustaining community that helps each other. So how we can also do that by looking a little bit further afield. We don't just have to, because data doesn't, data doesn't abide by regional, you know, once it's open on the internet, it can be anywhere. It can be used by anybody at all. Um, so we're sort of pitching the idea at the moment, sharing the idea with other European cities of which Helsinki is one of them through their uh, Finnish level six city piece um, about sharing ideas in this space. So if we, if we say that quantity and quality are two of the big barriers to, you know, real open data use, at the moment, we're going to be trying to tackle those uh, barriers through this program um, and get there. But the use is still going to be a barrier as well. So, if that community in Scotland isn't self-sustaining enough on its own, how can we how can we engage and, and develop it further? Um, so, we want to basically, you know, highlight uh, to these other countries what we're doing in Scotland. We want to get the reciprocal kind of highlighting from them um, and and work towards common common areas, common goals, so that uh, coders from Sweden are working with coders from Scotland in areas that they both have specialisms um, and, and, and working towards solving common problems. And this is really good for the enterprise agencies, they love this, because this is international supply chains, um, you know, getting groups of people together that can help each other and, and help business um, as well. So it could be really beneficial. And we're going to be, you know, exploring that in the next kind of three to six months. Um, and also the Scottish Cities Alliance is part of something called the World Cities Programme as well. Um, so there's other opportunities through that as well. So we're, we're hopeful there. Um, and then we want to collaborate with, with you in this room, obviously. We want to learn from the best. So we've heard from Chicago and Helsinki today who are leaders <laughs> um, in open data. Um, so we want to do that. We want to learn with other cities outside whether it's Europe or whatever, and we want to learn from everybody really because data isn't just about in the cities. Um, and these, you know, groups around themes could be, you know, city regions or, or Scotland wide or whatever. Um, 
So the cities will be working to provide a higher quality and, and more usable data through the work, um, sustainable as well, so it's always there. Um, we'll be looking to illustrate and indicate the problems we <coughs> have um, and engage outwardly through this programme, because this programme gives us that opportunity, because it's a funding pot is there and it's there until 2018, so we get the opportunity through it. Um, but we want you know, other people to help grow the open data community ecosystem by being part of it. And we, we are not precious about whether you come from Scotland or not. Um, uh, we want to work across themes, um, to engage with all groups. Uh, more eyes on our data is always going to be beneficial, we feel. Um, and that more people solving our city's issues is beneficial for, for the cities, but for Scotland as well. Um, and hopefully works further towards delivering solutions that services uh, the citizens need. Um, so yeah, th thank you very much for your time and today. Um, and uh, any questions? I guess is that Steve. Uh, so the the the, the alliance works with uh, local government. I mean, go local yeah. local councils. But yeah. the the perspective is: is there any involvement and commitment from the Scottish government? You know, the Parliament. Uh, how, how does that work? Um, yeah, so Scottish, Scottish government are a partner okay. in, in the group um, and they do provide some funding okay. as well, um, which can be then accessed by the seven cities. Yeah, and they do provide some input as well. Um, so on the standard side of things, we've got a guy who's is very kind of world renowned, uh, Peter Wynne Stanley, in terms of data management, data standards, and he's working quite closely with us, um, which has been very helpful, I think. Um, and so... Yeah, but in some areas, they, they, uh, and I can't really speak for like the low carbon or the hydrogen or whatever, mm -hmm. um, in some areas they do more than they do in others. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think there's like a written down remit of what exactly yeah. the involvement level will be. So this might be a better question for the later discussion. Mm -hmm. So as, as respectfully to the PIs, if I won't be heard if you say to table it. Um, I think we, we overthink issues of data quality and standardization and governance. And I think we get so caught up in these details that um, we hinder efforts. I would further postulate that you have certain common attributes of data which allow you to get interesting problems. That example I used earlier was spatial attributes. Um, <clears throat> but often there are two sides. It. You have people like me saying it's better to get the data out there and afterward figure out nomenclature and semantics and ontologies. But then you might have Helsinki who will have a little more rigor. I'd be curious what your thoughts are at this point. Or maybe it's a broader question, just what is the right way to manage something like that? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think, and you probably mentioned this earlier, but for example, the geographical systems or the, the, site, <coughs> the systems that manage or record time, uh, when you're releasing data, they, they could quite often be different uh, in the same city using two different systems to spatial information um, and also the same for, for Timmy's information. Um, and it ends up at a point where it's hard for some developers to figure that out and reuse it. So I feel that there is a need, well, proper metadata and describing your data is the most important thing so people can reuse it, but I think there is a need for some work to be done to sort of standardise that, that, that data so that people understand and can always, always use it um, in a more easy way, I think. Um, and I feel from from speaking with developers that have used the data in hackathons and things like that, there is a, there is a need for it. And, that, and they will ask for something better. They will always ask for something better. So I suppose uh, the role of the cities is to decide how far to go. And I think that's part, part of your question, is how far do you think it should go? Um, and without any kind of real strong guidance uh, from, say, the UK government on how far you should go in this, um, my, my view would be to do some hard things for the developer community um, that can make it so much easier to reuse the data. Uh, but I th think you have to probably assess and decide 
on a case by case or like theme by theme basis um, where to invest that money because you don't have you know unbelievable amounts of money to invest in that standardization process um, but <coughs> now also saying all that that's with the muddy complex landscape of how things are at the moment I think there's, there's definite value in, in new procurements building up better or, or, or more standardised uh, data? Well, let me complicate it slightly. So there's, there's two different problems that, that we can consider. So using your example on spatial. So coordinate systems are inherently complicated. You have many, many different things in, in the US. We have state plane systems, you have latitude, longitude, things like that. However, <coughs> you can get into ridiculously long conversations as to how many digits to the right of the decimal point you want to use for a latitude value. So are those things we should actually be deciding? I think that's an interesting question. I would argue just put out whatever you have and if someone wants to round up to eight to the right, God bless. Um, <laughs> But, you know, and if you feel really strongly and you want to stay with nine, I think that's okay. Um, that's problem set one, in which I think that is, it behooves us to put out raw data as long as we understand the math behind convergence. It's problem two, which I think is less solvable. Um, let's take an example from the US. Now, if Eddie goes into Chicago and he punches someone in the face from a crime type at the city level that is a battery. Okay? Mm -hmm. However, if Eddie, as he's on a road trip, um, goes to New York City, punches someone else in the face and he's arrested, that is an assault. There is no standard. Um, and it's, from a data perspective, completely two different terms. Now, as a computer scientist, I try and think, how do I solve this problem? And the combinatorics of it are actually just, irrit just irritating. So something <coughs> to solve this, it's a ridiculous spider web of ontologies. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the better solution? Is it better to just put it out there? Or is it instead better to just try and solve a problem where I'm gonna give you my opinion, I don't think we can solve it. And I don't think there's a technical way. And if you solve it once, you'll only solve it once and eventually it will be obsolete. Now, that data is valuable to put out, but there is really no technical solution to it. So I think there's a couple interesting problems. And Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, and we, we found the same in Scotland with the planning, planning data. So data around <coughs> what, what is under review for planning or, or what stages of different planning process they're at. And um, uh, a private sector company came and said, I can't understand all the different ones across Scotland because there's 28 in Scotland alone. And he wanted to develop some type of application <coughs> that was, that was um, free of charge to the user, but he was going to make money off it somehow, obviously. But to be able to to use that data effectively would well, potentially be too much of a barrier for them actually to use it at all. Um, and I, 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 that's why I think that on a use by use case basis, there are real advantages to the local authorities doing, being more conformist and not just saying we've done it this way all the time. Um, a huge barrier in getting people to change to a different system because they've used it for 20 years. Um, but I think moving towards more standardization in that example would be a benefit. Um, and even if it's down to things like making sure that you record uh, data in a field, for example, and don't just miss it um, completely, which can happen, or, or you, use, you use a drop down list and you've only got 10 options and you just have to, to use it, that kind of thing. Um, I think, well, from my, my perspective, there's a definite value in doing that normalization uh, at some stage and, and doing it before it's provided as open data. But you're making a very good point, which is something that <coughs> is additional, which is improving systems for creating better transactional systems. 
So software systems that were designed 10, 20 years ago were not done thoughtfully for how to extract data. Um, I, I think something that's both interesting academically and from an implementation perspective is as you design a new system, think not just about what the transaction, transaction the system is doing, but the future of the data. You know, adding structure, adding bounds, adding ways to, to make it uh, make more sense. Your point is really valid. There. Yeah, and, and I think as well that the, the end user of the service doesn't care necessarily what local authority the data came from. They care about a service that, that works for them. And, and I know we had a chat last night about some services that are use data in a way that maybe isn't all great. But um, th that, that, in terms of providing a service that the citizen wants, which is you know, one of the key things I guess we're working towards at the moment, and is one of the key things that Smart City Driver, creating those services, I think, um, I think there, is, there is that bit there as well. But it's a hard question, <laughs> and I, I don't think today, till today I've formulated a thought like that on it. You're, you're at a good place now, because now's a, a point where you can guide it and learn from others' mistakes. It's always easier to fix it on at this point than, uh, crap, a couple of years from now, oops. So, yeah, I think I, they're hard. Yeah, 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 definitely. Can I just follow on from that? Um, so, in, in terms of the GDPR stuff that's, yeah. that's coming in the mix and the information the Commissioner's Office consultation process and all that kind of stuff, how does that impact on, on the approach to standards and standardisation? Has, has it kind of featured in, in the conversations yet or yeah, is it likely to? It will do, Doug, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it has to, obviously. Um, and. There's a reluctance every time I think when a new something comes in like that, um, to necessarily. But um, the Smart Cities Working Group we had earlier this week, um, we we were talking quite a lot about the need to consider that. Uh, so even work that's been done on a sharing and learning platform between the cities is going to have to be revisited in light of that, um, because of the slightly well different. Let's call them different. Um, restrictions that are in place, um, but the, I suppose the main th the main reason for it is is fundamentally sound in terms of what your your privacy, uh, what we call it, rights are, um, and it's going to take a step a step further forward, isn't it? And then people wanting other rights like their safety, for example, um, might end up coming to play in the future that that bites back against it potentially. Um, but I, I just, yeah, I just think we have to. It's just one of these things that it's it's now a law, right? <laughs> so or whatever the term is. Um, so you have to, and it comes back to it's not just data literacy, but it's literacy of everything around you, like legal literacy and things yeah, like that, yeah. which um, it is important that people try and understand where other people are coming from, so they can have that discussion. So the procurement for the platform, we added some more things in just before it went out, just to make sure um, from people that understood it properly yeah. that it was going to be OK. Yeah. You know, so I mean, yeah, in terms of trust and reassurance as well, in terms of the, you know, the way that data can be used, um, you know, threats in terms of uh, things like re-identification of you know, individuals or groups or, or whatever, where yeah. you know, that's, that's quite sensitive. All of those issues, I think, are compliance issues as much as standardised right. yeah. issues, right? So, <laughs> Yeah, so you're right, I think your know, legal literacy, I, I think, comes into that. Sure, yeah. Re-identification is going to be, that will blow up at some point. So CS is actively working on this, and, you know, what's, what's, there's going to be enough open data out there that eventually there'll be an incident. Uh, the key is going to be to weather the storm um, and, and not have it be a real rollback. Like, I'd love to see more proactive work, but, um, you know, I think that's TBD. Mm. Yeah, there's other things as well, like around synthetic data. I don't know if people have explored that. Um, but so you're, you're, you're publishing, like, data that's not personal, but it is personal, you know, so you can maybe make the same level of insight from it. But it's, 
it's not personal data. I don't know enough about it um, to really talk about it, but I think, so this IT solutions come in that will help as well as big data solutions that might not help. <laughs> so yeah. No other questions, thank you very much. Okay, no problem.